Hello, my name is Voya and welcome to my deep guide. Well, today we are taking an in-depth look at the big one, the tab Ultra from Books. Before we dive in, full disclosure, this unit was sent to me as a review loan unit from Books. And while I definitely appreciate that opportunity, uh, Books doesn't really have any say or any control over how the devices are perceived and marked and basically what I say. This independence is a very important factor for me and it is only made possible through your support. So please like, subscribe, participate in the conversation down below with the comments and if you would like to actually further support my deep guide you can head on over to mydeepguide.com shop and check out the my daily organizer 2023 which is a daily weekly monthly quarterly yearly organizer for your professional or personal needs it doesn't matter but it's specially tailored for e-note devices such as the tab ultra and now onwards with the review Tab Ultra is marketed as an e-paper tablet PC with Android 11. Unlike any other e-ink tablet or device before it, it has actually a specially designed GPU for faster screen refreshing and much improved ghosting performance. It also has a 16 megapixel rear camera that can be used as a scanner to scan documents and send them on the go. For all intents and purposes, Tab Ultra is supposed to be a productivity device that allows the user to centralize their workflow behind an e-ink powered device. That is a tall order. Tab Ultra is priced at 599 US dollars. In the Books Euro Shop, you can choose between two bundle packages. Bundle A for 650 euros includes the device, magnet case, tote bag, stylus case, and extra nibs. And bundle B, priced at 710 euros, includes everything bundle A does plus the keyboard cover, which standalone costs 110 US dollars. In the package, you will find the standard kit for Books devices, the device, USB cable, Pen2 Pro, and the support documentation. Fairly standard packaging with the exception that you get the Pen 2 Pro as standard with the Tab Ultra. The Tab Ultra follows a modern blocky tablet design that we have seen now for several years in regular tablets on the market. It looks good and has a smaller footprint than the Note Air family of devices. The design is more professional and less on the kitschy and flashy side of things. At 6.7 mm thickness, it's 1 mm thicker than the Note Air family of devices and 2 mm thicker than the Remarkable 2. It weighs actually at 500 or or 504 grams, even though the specifications say 480 grams, when away the unit it was 502 or 505 grams, which is not only misrepresented in the specifications material, but also considerably heavier than any other Note Air device. So it's chunkier and heavier design than what we'd normally see in an e-ink device from books. At the back you will see a protruding camera that sticks out in a two-step manner and the total distance is 2.5 millimeters. This is something that I really don't like because among other things Tab Ultra is supposed to be a note-taking device and the protruding camera makes it impossible to use it on a flat surface without it moving all over the place while writing. The user is then forced to use the device in the magnetic cover which helps flatten things out in the back but also adds another 2.5 millimeters of thickness and a bit more weight. On the top is the power button that doubles as a fingerprint reader, a microphone and one of the two speakers. Power button is perfectly level with the side and has no relief or indentation which makes it relatively difficult to locate by touch alone. On the bottom edge of the device you will find the other speaker, another microphone, a micro SD card slot and a USB-C port. Overall I like the design but it is more on the chunkier side of things and one could argue that the Tab Ultra looks maybe a bit too ordinary. Tab Ultra has an all-metal bucket body design and a glass-covered flush screen top. As mentioned, it is a thicker and heavier device, which makes it a bit less comfortable to handle as a traditional e-ink reader or a tablet. On the other hand, it is not meant to be a traditional e-reader or a note-taker. Also mentioned before, the protruding camera on the back makes it uncomfortable to write on the device unless the device is placed in a magnetic cover, which adds weight and thickness. Ergonomically, I can be fine with those two things. What is actually a problem for me are the 
edges of the metal body. The chamfered edges are relatively thin, and the screen surface is not perfectly level with the edges. Instead, it is slightly sunken in by approximately 0.12 millimeters. While this may sound minuscule, it is something that you will definitely feel in the palms of your hands because of the weight of the device and the materials used. The result is that the edges of the Tab Ultra do feel a bit sharper than what I would expect from a device of this caliber, and it can cause discomfort in certain situations. This is something that can probably be improved by adding a screen protector on top of it, which would further minimize the sunkenness of the screen and the height of the metal edges on the sides. Overall, while a nice looking device, the Tab Ultra is not what I would characterize as an overly comfortable reader type of a device. The weight and thickness may seem like a negative side for the practicality of the Tab Ultra. That might be true, but only if you look at a Tab Ultra as a traditional e-reader, which it is not. Because remember, Tab Ultra is a tablet PC device, and when you look at it from that perspective, then it actually is a very practical device, especially if the keyboard cover is added to the mix. The build quality is very good overall. It feels and looks like a premium device. Aside from the already mentioned protruding edge around the screen, the biggest issue quality-wise for me was that the rear camera cover wasn't perfectly aligned with the device's body. The rear camera cover on the unit that I have received is slightly slanted, and while the difference is small, a deviation of 0.36 millimeter on the long side and 0.16 millimeters on the short side of the camera. This is something that I immediately noticed and reacted to. For a device at this price range, that is not an okay thing to see. Overall, I like the design and the build quality of the Tab Ultra, but there definitely are some issues on both fronts that should be kept in mind. There are three covers available for the Tab Ultra. Magnetic cover, standard keyboard cover, and the special keyboard cover. The only real difference between the keyboard covers is the enter button. Everything else is the same. Therefore, I'll be addressing only the magnetic cover and the standard keyboard cover here. The design is the same for both the magnetic and the keyboard covers. They both attach to the device via a strong magnetic back and remain stuck to the device securely. Neither of the covers is a protective cover or a case, so don't expect fall protection for your device. The keyboard cover has rigid metal sides on both front and back that extend beyond the width of the device. This can theoretically provide protection for the device, but this would be only the case for bumps and minor falls. Anything more serious will overpower the magnetic connection most likely, and the device is very likely to fall out of the cover and get damaged. So keep in mind that these are, as their name clearly implies, covers, not protective cases. The materials look really beautiful, are nice to the touch, and feel like fall leather. The build quality is excellent, and while there isn't any stitching on the sides, it really does feel like a quality product that will stand the test of time. Both covers are as thin as they technically can be while providing the function and level of protection that they were intended to provide. The magnetic cover weighs at 182 grams and the keyboard cover is much heavier at whopping 415 grams. In fact, the whole package with the device, pen and the keyboard cover weighs in at 931 grams. And that would be a terrible amount of weight for a simple e-reader. But for a tablet PC, well, my Lenovo Tab P11 Pro with the cover and keyboard, no pen here, weighs at 948 grams. So from that perspective, the cumulative weight of the Tab Ultra is actually good. So it's all about the perspective. The magnetic cover lacks a magnet on the front side to hold the cover in a folded state and also connected to the front of the device when it is in a covered state. This problem isn't apparent on the keyboard cover because I think that there is an actual magnet that keeps it in place, but you also have the pen holder flap present and that will also help keep the front lid closed. The keyboard has a US keys layout and it is very nice to see full size keys on it with a decent travel and space. This makes the keyboard very comfortable to use for a portable keyboard. The special keys linked to the Android OS functionalities also increase the overall productivity of the device, and the keyboard cover indeed does transform the Tab Ultra into a laptop-like device. It is very easy to put the device in and take it out of the covers. The front of the cover can fold and can be used in two positions. This is for the magnetic cover, 120 degrees for viewing and 12 degrees for writing. While all that sounds nice, the folding works only for landscape orientation of the device and 120 degree position for viewing 
really isn't that stable as it would actually slip and let the device fall on the back more than once. The keyboard cover has a completely different type of functionality as it is designed to be used in landscape orientation and it docks the device firmly into place when connected to the keyboard. This is an excellent position and the keyboard to screen relationship transforms the Tab Ultra into a true laptop-like device that is very enjoyable to use. Both covers do an okay job at what they were intended to do, but are also very costly. The magnetic cover at $50 feels like it is too expensive considering what it offers and what limitations it has. The keyboard cover is also very expensive at $110, but there you do get a sense of value because of the docking design and the keyboard quality and everything else. Then again, you can get a very good Bluetooth keyboard for a lot less, so there's also that to think about. It has a Qualcomm octa-core CPU that runs at 2.02 gigahertz, has four gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM, has 128 gigabytes of UFS 2.1 standard storage that is actually expandable to two terabytes via the micro SD card slot. The screen is a 10.3 inch HD e-ink Carta glass screen with a flat cover lens and that runs the resolution, the standard one, 1872 by 1404 at 227 ppi. As far as touch capabilities, it has a Books Stylus Touch with 4096 levels of pressure sensitivity plus capacitive touch. Tab Ultra is equipped with a massive 6300 milliamp battery. It has wireless connection for both Wi-Fi standards 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and also it has a Bluetooth 5.0 functionality. As far as ports goes, it has a USB-C and a micro SD card slot. It has a G sensor that is there for auto rotation. It has a 16 megapixel rear camera that's used mainly for scanning purposes, power button with a fingerprint recognition built in, built in dual speakers, built in dual microphones. It runs on Android 11 with pre enabled Google Play stores and the dimensions are 225 by 184.5 by 6.7 millimeters and the weight even though the specifications say that it's at 480 grams it's actually at 500 and four grams. It supports a wide array of document formats, image formats, audio formats, and other third-party apps. Tab Ultra comes with the Pen 2 Pro as standard. This is overall a very good pen with an eraser on the back. The build quality has been improved since the first iteration of this pen, the one with the orange eraser cap. So this is an all plastic pen, but it has a nice structure to it. It's not too slippery, it's not too heavy at 18 grams, and it is well balanced, which makes it comfortable to use for longer periods of time. The pen is equipped with a very strong magnet that holds onto the device really, really well. The magnetic hold is so strong that it's actually possible to lift the device all into the air only via the pen, so half a kilo of the device is able to be held by this magnetic connection. The only thing that makes this pen a little bit impractical is the length, as the pen is actually rather long, and when you need to flip it around to erase content, it can be a tiny bit cumbersome after a while. So if you do it like once or twice, that's fine, but on a longer kind of session, it's a little bit longer, but then again, this will depend on individual habits. The quality of the new Pen 2 Pro is very good, and the main thing that I disliked about the original version, which was squeaking under pressure, this is no longer present here at all, and that's a good thing to see. It uses the regular nib standard, which means that the user has quite a few options to choose from on the market, and various different nibs can be actually used with this pen. So for example, Remarkable 2 nibs, or Samsung nibs, or something like that. The pen has a good writing quality to it. Pressure sensitivity is actually nicely calibrated, and it reacts well to natural movement, which can be seen on pressure sensitive uh, brushes. It feels a lot better than the standard books pen, but if I compare it to my Samsung S6 Lite or the S7 pens, then the Pen 2 Pro has a certain hardness quality to it, which may or may not be to your liking. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, I think this comes to an individual's preference. Extended writing sessions with the Pen 2 Pro are not an exhaustive affair at all. 
There are pens out there that start to have a negative effect on the hand 10 minutes into a writing session, but that's not, definitely not the case here. While doing the battery life testing and writing continuously for two consecutive hours, that hand did get tired only after 90 minutes of writing. Neither the pen nor the device were the cause of it. It had to do with the simple fact that I was actually writing for two hours straight. Overall, this is a very good pen that can satisfy most needs uh, for writing and interacting with the device. Also keep in mind that the Pen 2 Pro alone costs around 80 bucks and that is an excellent value to see that it's included as standard with the Tab Ultra. Tab Ultra comes with an absolutely massive 6300 milliamp battery packed into the device. Now, while that sounds like a complete overkill, there is a very good reason why they went with more than double their ordinary battery capacity in the Tab Ultra, because that's definitely a compromise both for the thickness and for the weight of the device. And the reason behind it is that all of that magnificent speed with the new GPU comes at a very steep power price. And the consequence of that is that the battery life in some areas, not all, but in some areas is actually quite a bit shorter than what we've come to expect from 10.3 inch devices from books. On to the reading performance. And the way they, that I do the reading performance test is that I enable the auto flip pages functionality on the Neo Reader. And I do the exact same test on all of the books devices. So that gives a very, very good kind of reference point how they measure up amongst each other. And I repeated the same test on the uh, Tab Ultra. I let it flip pages for about three hours in three separate scenarios. Scenario one is with the front light 50%, Wi-Fi on in all of the scenarios. Then scenario two is front light at 25% and scenario three is front light completely turned off. With the front light set at 50% exactly, Tab Ultra was actually spending at around 5% of battery life per hour, which actually uh, amounts to around 20 hours of total constant reading time or flipping pages every 20 seconds per charge. That's quite a bit lower than what we're used to. More on the comparisons a little bit later. Now, scenario two was front light 25%. And in that uh, scenario, Tab Ultra was spending 4.33% of battery per hour, which amounts to around 23 hours of flipping pages every 20 seconds. And when the front light was turned off, the results were exactly the same at 4.33% or 23 hours per charge. Now that is actually a lot worse than what we've come to expect and how other devices from books, especially 10.3 inch devices have been performing before. So for example, my two year old Note Air 1, it has just received the update OS 3.3.1. So both of the devices are running the same OS, the same document and doing the same type of operations. And the Note Air 1 performed uh, <laughs> the following way. With the 50% front light turned on, it would have a 37.45 hours of page flipping per charge, which is 87.25% better than the Tab Ultra. Then at front light at 25%, Note Air 1 would average out at 59.88 hours per charge of reading time, which is 160.35% uh, more better than uh, Tab Ultra. And with the front lights turned off, the estimate for the Note Air was around 100 hours per charge, which is a whopping 334.78% more than the Tab Ultra. Yikes. These results actually put the Tab Ultra into a full on lower category as far as the reading battery performance goes. That new GPU and the screen refreshing and all the operations that it's actually doing is really coming at a high cost. Now the writing portion of the battery test is performed 
again the same way for all the devices. I manually write in two sets of conditions for continuously for one hour. Uh, yes, it's a painful test, but okay. Um, so um, the first scenario is uh, front light at 25%, Wi-Fi on, continuously writing for one hour, and then I turn the front light off, and then I continue writing for another hour with the front light turned off, and then I take the results. With the front light set at 25%, and indeed when turned off, the results were exactly identical. And that's actually expected because when you're writing, the biggest uh, power consumer is going to be the CPU uh, because it's actually processing a lot of juice and it's actually quite, quite processor intensive to deliver the handwriting, especially at these speeds. And the results were actually quite good because it averaged at around 12.5 hours per charge of constant writing. Now that's actually very good. And it's way more in line with what I would expect from a device like this uh, to actually deliver. And in my book, anything, any device that actually can deliver more than 10 hours, so 10 hours and plus per charge of constant writing, and please remember that's like constant writing, that there's no situation in reality where you're gonna be doing that. But any device that can actually deliver 10 plus hours and tab ultra is definitely there because it's at 12 and a half hours that's an excellent battery result as far as i'm concerned now, as far as video watching performance, because that was one of the questions, I was unable to complete that test, unfortunately, because there is currently a bug in the system or um, irritating la feature in the system. And it's a twofold thing. The main problem is that you can't set the auto sleep to off. So it's always gonna go to sleep and the latest period that you can give it is 10 minutes. And why is that a problem? Well, because whenever I would play a video or a YouTube and I wanted to kind of play it for an hour and then see how much it actually uh, drains the battery and get an estimate out of that. But that's not possible because during the playback of YouTube, when the auto sleep timer kicks in, it actually puts the device to sleep regardless of what it is doing, including YouTube watching. And there's no way I'm gonna be babysitting it and just kind of tapping it for, for an hour and then just to see that. So uh, I wasn't able to complete that test, unfortunately. So while the actual battery performs performance on the Tab Ultra is a bit mixed. It's definitely in line with what I would expect it to do in standby and in writing performance. All great there, but the reading performance is significantly lower than what I have come to expect from a 10.3 inch device from books. So that's something that you definitely need to keep in mind. Tab Ultra uses a monochromatic 10.3 inch HD Carta screen, which means that this is a glass top screen with a standard resolution of 14 by 1872 at 227 ppi. Well, this has been a standard for a very long time. It needs to be mentioned here that a new standard will be set very shortly by the upcoming Amazon Scribe, which will be the first 10.2 inch e-ink device that will have a picture density of 300 ppi. And that puts the Tab Ultra's screen resolution specifications a little bit into the last generation category. Books have opted to go with the less paper-like screen surface for both Tab Ultra and the Nova Air 2 this time around. This results in a surface that provides better image quality and clarity, but at the expense of absence of paper-like writing feel and feedback. The different approach applies to the screen surface also has an adverse effect on the reflectivity of the screen surface. Reflections are both stronger in intensity and less diffuse. This means that there will be situations where the screen reflections might turn into a distraction, sharp light points reflected in the screen at higher intensity than the actual screen content, for example, or or a glare when facing a large and strong light source say like the sun or a window on a very bright day. Thankfully, this is an issue that can be easily solved by applying a reflection dimming screen protector, for example, that can at the same time improve three things, better reflectivity, better paper-like feel, and lowering the protrusion of the sharp edges of the device by adding a slight thickness of the screen protector. However, this will also have a negative impact on the image clarity and contrast. 
it seems that we just can't seem to have our cake and eat it too. The new panels from e-ink should offer overall lower thickness and this can be observed actually on the Tab Ultra. The distance from the tip of the stylus to the actual display of the content is normally at around 1.1, 1.2 millimeters on books devices. But on the Tab Ultra, this has been lowered to just under one millimeter at around 0.98 millimeters. Well, seemingly not a big difference. In reality, anything that gets the tip of the pen physically closer to the surface displaying your writing strokes will improve the overall writing feel and experience. And this is definitely the case with the Tab Ultra and the new e-ink screen. While the new approach has had negative impact on the screen reflectivity, it definitely helps with the screen clarity, contrast, and overall image quality. When compared to other devices that had the paper-like screen surface, you can actually see that the text crispness is a more defined, contrast is stronger, and the overall clarity is improved. On individual examples, this difference might not seem like much, but when reading a long text, it actually does make a difference and it makes reading on the Tab Ultra a slightly more relaxed affair for the eyes than on an equivalent device with a paper-like surface. Color banding has finally been eliminated from Neo Reader with the update 3.3, and now it's actually possible to enable that option on any device that's running the OS version 3.3 and up tab ultra included it's a little bit convoluted where to find it so you have to go into the menu then into the contrast and there at the bottom in the contrast itself you have picture dithering and that is something that will make these images look really really nice and uh, finally we have proper blending of the uh, shades of gray on the books platforms. Ghosting performance on the Tab Ultra is the best I have ever seen on any e-ink device. Books have done something that no one has dared to do up until now, which is basically develop a dedicated GPU for e-ink display devices, and the results are fantastic. Regardless of the speed mode used, the ghosting performance is always several steps ahead of what you're used to or what you've come to expect from an e-ink device. Screen refresh speed is something that has also been dramatically improved on the Tab Ultra by that dedicated GPU. And this is the area where Tab Ultra basically redefines how we perceive an e-ink device. And no, that's not an exaggeration. We now do have a generational shift and uh, we can safely talk about the e-ink screen refresh speed performance and ghosting performance before the Tab Ultra and from or after Tab Ultra. My initial impression was that the actual screen refresh speed is dramatically faster than that of a regular e-ink device. For example, any generation of Note Air device. The responsiveness of the Tab Ultra is literally on another level. Um, and it's genuinely difficult to associate the performance and the interactivity that you have with the Tab Ultra with a traditional e-ink device. The level of smoothness in every single operation on the Tab Ultra is basically just doesn't match what we've come to expect of an e-ink uh, display and an e-ink device. So from general UI navigation to reading, browsing, scaling, writing, any op operation that you actually choose to do is the absolute smoothest and cleanest experience that I have ever had on any e-ink device. So that means that uh, your experience with the interaction of these devices, it, it, it's quickly transformed uh, and you interact with the device differently. So it feels like quite a step back when going back to a regular e-ink device after spending a couple of days with the Tab Ultra. So it's a, uh, it's a dangerous thing to get used to. Now, subjective impressions are one thing, but cold hard facts are another. So I tested the screen refresh rates by displaying a specially developed app that displays and counts frames at 144 frames per second. And then I would display a video 
at 60 frames per second again with a counter. With a high speed camera, the footage is recorded and then the frames displayed on the screen are counted and averaged between the two tests and the results for the Tab Ultra are as follows. In HD or normal mode, the display speed is at around 5 frames per second, which is around 25% faster than the Note Air 1. In the balanced mode, we jump to 9 frames per second, which is 80% faster than the Note Air 1. In the fast mode, we're going into double digits, 11 frames per second, which is 57.1 faster than the Note Air 1. And ultra fast mode is 14 frames per second, which is 55.5% faster faster than the Note Air 1. And in the Regal mode, if anyone is interested, the performance is 3 frames per second. So the speed difference combined with the smoothness, the clarity, the lack of ghosting, uh, everything that the new GPU actually provides makes all of the difference in perception of the device responsiveness when actually using it in the real world. Tab Ultra has a standard dual color independently controllable front light which has adequate, quite good uniformity. While still not on the same quality level of the comfort light that Kobo devices have or the Kindle devices, it does the job really really well and is one of the best ones that I've seen on books devices so far. Tab Ultra offers the fastest, smoothest and cleanest e-ink experience to date. The dedicated GPU makes all of the difference and places the Tab Ultra clearly in a category of its own. The image quality is crisp and the contrast level is high. However, as discussed, this comes at the expense of the late lack of paper-like uh, feel and somewhat distracting reflectivity of the uh, screen surface, which will be an issue users will face under certain lighting conditions. But as also discussed, this is something that can be improved by using and applying a reflection diffusing uh, paper like it doesn't have to be a paper like as long as it's a screen protector that does reflection diffusion then that would be a good thing to consider but other than that absolutely amazing performance on the tab ultra well some of the gestures have changed in the overall platform the general modus operandi in the new reader is the same as it has been for quite some time however those changes actually introduce a couple of oddities and inconveniences. The new back gestures are basically swiping from the edge of the screen left and right towards the inside and that is a swipe gesture for previous and next page. True, you can tap also here and there but if you're used to actually using this gesture to flip your page from the edge of the corner of the screen, you will be faced with this issue, this issue which is basically exiting, backing out of the document every time you want to flip a page, which is completely ridiculous. Now the swipe gesture still works, but only if you start it on the screen itself and not from the edge itself. So that requires an un unnecessary level of attention from the user to actually just do a page flip. So that's something that's really, really silly. Whoever came up with this innovation obviously didn't test it on a user sample as this is something that pops up immediately. Also, these gestures are in direct conflict with expanding of the uh, floating toolbars if you choose to have them hidden. So if you have this handle, that, then it's not a problem. You tap a handle and then it works. But if that handle is actually, there's an option there to hide it, the gesture to show them is actually swiping from the edge, which is going to actually exit the document. So it's a direct conflict between those. Luckily, it's possible to customize the function of these gestures or disable them entirely by going into the systems, settings, navigation, which solves basically this issue. And then you can choose a custom function for each of these, or in fact, you can also disable them as well, which definitely solves that problem. The other problem is not so easily solved, and it has to do with the refresh settings while while in Neo Reader or any other app that has its own refresh settings. If you attempt to switch the refresh mode in uh, the e-ink center while in Neo Reader, you will notice that you can't do that anymore. 
Instead, this can now only be achieved from the Neo Reader's settings in the Refresh section. So the changing of the Refresh mode in Neo Reader has been transformed for a, from a simple gesture, which is swipe and tap, like two-step gesture, to a cumbersome one, two, three, and then choose your Refresh mode in the fourth step. And to make it even more inconvenient, the refresh icons here don't match the e-ink center icons and there is no text to describe which icon corresponds to which refresh mode. Brilliant UX design worthy of a slow clap for sure. General operations in your reader remain largely unchanged, so you can still access the settings menu by tapping it in the middle of the screen. You can long press the text to actually select it and highlight it and add the annotations if you want to. You can bookmark pages, have the document be read to you, auto flip pages, and a lot more. New Reader has some of the best formatting capabilities of any e-reader platform out there, and this remains true on the Tab Ultra. So EPUB formatting is never a problem, uh, it always works because it's that type of a format, but formatting capabilities on PDFs is where NeoReader truly shines. Between the flexible cropping options, reflowing, having an article mode, comic mode, custom settings mode of the navigation, uh, split view functionalities coupled with auto rotation, you will be able to easily format almost any PDF document to your needs quickly and easily. And in the split view, you can actually choose between multiple modes, which is horizontal, vertical, which is something that's new. So you can split it up in that way as well. You can uh, have a split view of a current document only, current document and another document, document and a dedicated notepad, which is associated with that document, and this document and a translation of the document as well. So truly, um, awesome amount of power in the Neo Reader. It's of course possible to mark up the documents using most of the standard writing tools from notebooks. The performance is equally great, but the ease of use is not that high here. The main reason is the complexity that's still present, and you can easily get lost between the tough. To me, it's unnecessary to have two different floating toolbars. So you have the main tool floating toolbar here, and then when you tap on scribble options, then you get a completely different, fully customizable, different toolbar. And to make it even more kind of weird is that if you want to export your document, which oftentimes you might want to do, you can only do it from the scribble toolbar, which can only be accessed from either the uh, menu here, when you actually go to the scribble, or, and this is your icons for uh, exporting, or, by going into the scribble mode from here and then again to that same toolbar. I think that that's unnecessary, completely unnecessary to clutter things and basically be constantly confused in which toolbar toolbar am I at. And yeah, it, it, it's kind of overwhelming and confusing for an experienced user, especially for a newcomer. So yes, it is all fully customizable, which is excellent. And yes, it allows for a tremendous amount of control. And over time, the user will be able to learn these tools and customize them to their own needs. So you will get used to it. It will get better and less confusing. But the time it takes to get to that stage is relatively long. And the journey can be a bit overwhelming at times. And sometimes people actually even give up. There are multiple ways of of importing your documents and ebook libraries onto the Tab Ultra. So you can choose to use direct USB connection transfer, you can use Books Drop, you can use the Books Assistant app, Pushbooks website interface, third party synchronization apps, for example, such as AutoSync, direct online access to cloud services like Google Drive, Dropbox, etc or direct, direct online downloads from websites or other resources. You can export, as mentioned, from the Scribble toolbar, your marked up documents from the Tab Ultra and share them further in a multitude of different ways. Exported documents will retain the highlights, annotations, and pen markups, but the bookmarks will not be exported outside of the NeoReader environment. 
Since the Tab Ultra is using Android 11, this means that sharing the exported documents can be done in virtually any way you may want to, since you're going to be using the system's share option because you're sharing a file. So you can share it as an email attachment in your preferred email client app, upload it directly to your chosen cloud service, to your local LAN location, or print it on your wireless printer. It's also worth noting that the update 3.3 has finally brought the ability to synchronize the reading data between different books devices on the same account. So this can be done only by using the Pushbooks or the Books Assistant app, and it's now possible to synchronize the reading progress, bookmarks, highlights, underlines, annotations, and handwritten notes between documents and different devices. Tab Ultra is a very powerful tablet and it can easily tackle any document you throw at it. With the addition of the new GPU, the responsiveness of the device is improved significantly over its predecessors. Touch responsiveness is also improved due to the use of the new screen panel that's a little bit thinner. So all of these things combined result in a very responsive user uh, experience that feels much more like a regular tablet than an e-ink tablet. The flexibility of having auto rotation and a variety of formatting options. Um, for example, if you want to read it like this, you can just simply swap, swap it like this and it just works and it's so easy to just read in a much, much bigger format. Um, so that's really, really excellent and makes the Tab Ultra beautiful basically for reading purposes in either for uh, portrait or landscape orientations. How However, what would be even better is if the covers themselves were designed to support both orientations equally well, which they currently do not. So in the reading experience section as well, the Tab Ultra offers one of the fastest, smoothest and most flexible reading markup experiences on the market. While its size and weight are prohibitive to considering it to be a truly portable e-reader, as a working tool it really has a tremendous amount of value to offer and can quickly become an irreplaceable part of your daily workflow. Unfortunately, the notebook navigation suffers from the same back gestures issue that I was talking about and the Neo Reader. Thankfully, the same solution applies here and it's an easy problem to overcome, but it's a really baffling uh, situation here and I, I really don't understand why such a separate setup would even be left as a default option in the first place. Other than that, everything else is pretty much the same as you would expect from a books device and while functional, it's not all that terribly intuitive and it does have a bit of a learning curve as you might see. So a general overview of the notebook, your main options or main user interface is divided into two toolbars. The notebook toolbar on top where you will find in functions such as renaming of the notebook, your recently opened notebooks, pen presets, eraser, undo reader, and page navigation and overview. The side toolbar itself contains a wide array of tools at your disposal that can be used to populate the content of the notebook pages and it's customizable. This is where you can control layers and basically assign a background template in the base layer here. You can adjust the canvas size, you can insert different shapes, you can insert text, you can insert images, audio files, insert links to specific pages within the same notebook, and also a link to an external website. And you can also insert a recorder to record audio content, for example, in a meeting or something like that. You can select the content and modify it via the lasso tool. You can perform the handwriting to text conversion using the AI tool. You can toggle on and off the touch functionality. You can trigger manual the um, cloud synchronization. You can perform search of handwritten notes. You can manage pages by adding, deleting, and moving these pages around. You can toggle where the toolbar, side toolbar, will be located on which side. You can manage your audio recordings. You can customize the toolbar. You can share and save manually this uh, notebook that you're working on as well. In the update 3.3, the toolset of the notebook has been expanded to further include three important things. 
a tag system, which obviously has been inspired by the Remarkable. It works in a very, very similar fashion. You can insert links, as I mentioned, so that's clearly inspired by Supernote, although much more limited than the linking capabilities on the Supernote are at the moment. And you can also add marks to the recordings, the audio recordings, which is clearly inspired by the Huawei's MatePad paper. Regardless of where the inspiration came from, it's actually a very good thing to see that you have the combined functionality of different platforms implemented in one place here as well. So the options are, as you can see, very extensive, which amounts to a very powerful notebook tool although that also means a bit of a learning curve. As far as the brushes go, you can find the standard books set of brush options on the Tab Ultra. This is where you have your ink pen, brush pen, ballpoint pen, pencil, and the marker. You also have 16 different shades of color to choose from. Um, these will be displayed as shades of gray on the device itself or as black, depending on what you choose uh, in the settings. But if you are going to do a screen sharing session or or you export a notebook that has color content, the chosen colors will be displayed or contained in the file. It's possible to create and manage your own brush presets, which are added to the toolbar, which actually helps keep the upper toolbar clean and un cluttered. The brushes are mainly geared for note taking and while the pencil brush itself has been improved, like it, it definitely works better than it did before, um, it's still a long ways away from what we actually have on the Remarkable 2. So it's not something that I would characterize as uh, primarily a drawing tablet. You certainly can do some stuff with it, but it's not its main strong point. At all. Templates are added as the background for the base layer and as such can be controlled from the layers menu. The user has a wide variety of choices of built-in templates uh, here and you also have the ability to download additional ones from the cloud server as well. If the built-in choice is not up to your needs, you can also easily load and use your own custom templates uh, by copying them to the designated note templates folder on the device and choosing them from the local template category. Notebooks can be exported in multiple ways. You can choose to export all layers. So let's go to share. So sharing is where you export it first. So you can um, export it as a single page PNG. You can export it as a bitmap PDF, which means that all of the content will be baked into the pages of the PDF as an image or as a vector based PDF file where handwriting and all the other objects will remain as editable objects in a PDF. Naturally, the uh, vector based PDF is a larger file size PDF. So that's something to keep in mind. Sharing of exported notebooks has the same level of flexibility as sharing of documents or indeed any other file on the Tab Ultra because as soon as you share it, it becomes a PDF or a PNG file and then you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and you have the flexibility of tapping directly on share here and then it's going to export it and give you an option to share it. So it's just a nice shortcut in case you want to do it that way. On a books device, there isn't an automatic auto sync method available. In fact, you have to manually tell the device to synchronize and pull the data from the um, uh, setup cloud uh, accounts or whatever it may be that you want to use. If you choose to, you can use a books account to synchronize your notebook data across multiple devices. And that is definitely very, very convenient. You also have the ability to choose a different server. So for example, if you're not happy with having your data going through a Chinese server, you can choose a US server or a European server and then your data is not located in China, if that's basically what you're worried about. Synchronizing to the books account is basically currently the only way to store the notes or the notebooks in their native format, as the actual notebooks files are still not visible to the user. And as such, they unfortunately cannot be backed up or synchronized in their native format in any other way. You can set the notebook to automatically export 
the notebook as a PDF each time you exit the notebook itself. This way you can use another third party app to have an automated backup system of your notes in a PDF format, not in a native format because of the before mentioned limitation. And that way you get a peace of mind. You can also choose to bind your Dropbox, Evernote, OneNote or Udell cloud accounts to the notes sync, as you can see here, notes sync accounts, in addition to the books account. Um, or you can disable the books account and just use these. Um, that way, when you manually trigger the synchronize function, which is this one here, let me just show you. Uh, let's go back, it's this icon here. So when you actually manually trigger that, you will have your notes backed up in their native format on the books cloud, if you chose to do that that way, and as an exported PDF on your other chosen account or accounts. So you obviously have plenty of freedom and choice to set up a backup system that fits your needs. But one thing that lacks is the ability to backup your notes in their native format without the need to use the books account. And it would be a very nice thing to see that functionality brought in in the near future. Like everything else on the tab ultra hopping around menus, writing, drawing, adding objects and navigating around the uh, notebook itself is fast and effortless, thanks to the impressive performance of the device. One thing that actually still feels sluggish for whatever reason is the lasso tool, which lacks, lags severely behind the actual uh, uh, drawing here. It's something that would be nice if that was improved in the future updates. While it's technically possible to switch around between a portrait and the landscape orientation of a notebook, it's still somewhat clunky. And I don't, I, I, it's not something that I can actually recommend because it's just, it just works weird and it's not intuitive at all. Instead, uh, my recommendation would be to choose beforehand whether your notebook is going to be in the portrait or the landscape format, and then simply stick to it for that notebook. The functionality is there to make it somewhat possible to switch between the two orientations on the same notebook by using the canvas size thing. But both the canvas and the zooming tools that are involved in switching between portrait and the um, landscape uh, formats, they're still way too clunky and unintuitive to use efficiently, at least for me. And now we're at the time and at the part that I was very much interested in, and at is the DESTA test on the Tab Ultra, which is basically measuring the writing latency speed on the Tab Ultra. Since it was released in September of 2020, Remarkable 2 was the reigning champion and the yardstick of writing latency speeds against which all other have devices have measured and have tried to actually aspire towards. So the top of the line for over two years was 23.7 milliseconds. Very, very impressive. Supernote managed about a year ago to actually get remarkably close to the remarkable pun pun with their updates for both A6X and the A5X at an extremely impressive 24.6 milliseconds, which is really, really close, under one millisecond of a difference between the two. Very cool. And where did the books fit in all of this? Well, the fastest any of the books devices ever managed to actually deliver was the Note Air 2 at very respectable 33.78 milliseconds. So really fast and really, really good. Until now, that is. The Tab Ultra measures at the simply unbelievable 19.54 milliseconds of writing latency. This result was very important, so I repeated the test three times, three separate tests, each time 10 measurements and averaging out the values. And this is the result of actual 30 measurements. No other device was measured and tested that much as the Tab Ultra, but I really needed to make sure because that result makes the Tab Ultra the e-ink device with the fastest writing latency on the planet right now. The difference between the Remarkable 2 and the Tab Ultra is not just a small one like that we had between Remarkable and Supernote. It's actually 
a very large difference of 17.86%. And that is something that you most definitely feel and see. The consequence of this truly awesome speed and result is that when you're writing on the Tab Ultra, it really starts to feel like the writing is instantaneous. And that further improves the illusion of the connection between the tip of the pen and the surface that you're writing on, which further improves the overall writing experience. Truly impressive. But on top of that, the writing comfort is actually something that I did not expect at all that Tab Ultra is gonna actually have. In fact, I was really dreading the battery writing test because that's like two hours of constantly writing and only on the best of the best devices do I not have problems with the hand and hurt and fingertips and everything after doing a test like that. But in this case, despite it being thicker and bulkier and I have to use the magnetic uh, uh, cover to actually make it even more bulkier so that it doesn't kind of tilt and all that kind of stuff, when I actually started to write on it, it uh, really surprised me how effortless, smooth and easy it is to write on the Tab Ultra. That's something I did not expect at all. The edges didn't really bother me, the lack of the paper feel didn't bother me at all, the surface is really nice, works great with the offered nib and the pen, and the, the time actually flew by, which is definitely not the case in majority of situations when I'm performing these tests. It's probably due to the combination of multiple factors, the lower distance um, from the tip of the, the, the pen to the screen, the incredibly fast writing latency, the comfortable pen, the nice writing surface as well. I think that all of that combined actually gives um, attributes to this cumulatively excellent writing experience on the Tab Ultra. One thing that is somewhat lacking in the writing experience department on the Tab Ultra is definitely that paper-like feel. Obviously, this was a conscious decision on Books's part uh, in order to improve the clarity and the sharpness and the contrast in the image quality overall. And also an added benefit of this is that your nibs are gonna last considerably longer amount of time because they're not constantly being sanded down by that paper-like surface. While I don't mind the writing feel on it at all, in fact, I actually prefer it and I uh, quite liked it uh, and I start to like it more and more and more. It doesn't have anything to do with the paper-like feel at all. So if that's something that's a very, very important consideration for you and that's something that we're looking for, then you definitely have to be aware of that. So the lack of the paper-like feel, I don't mind that at all, but what I did mind in the writing experience was that reflectivity of the screen. There are simply situations and angles and everything where you actually set your up where the, the, the reflections are too sharp, too intense, and actually overpower in certain situations. Not all the time, but sometimes they can overpower the content of the screen, and that is a problem. So this is definitely something that I would look to remedy with an anti-reflection uh, uh, screen protector uh, to actually make that better um, if I were to decide to buy this device. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth works is expected on the Tab Ultra, and there were no no surprises there. It was effortless to pair and connect a Bluetooth keyboard, speaker, and headphones, and they all worked flawlessly. Wireless connection, on the other hand, uh, for the Wi-Fi, it was stable and fast in all normal situations when I've been using this uh, device. The USB OTG hub worked as expected, which means that the power pass-through works, USB peripherals work, so keyboard and a mouse, that worked fine. HDMI out did not work and the LAN did not work, which I don't know why, but that's kind of a consistent thing on books plat devices. This is by now a standard set of limitations and functionalities that I've come to expect from a books device, although it would be about time to fix the HDMI out functionality. Any other Android device that I tried to um, hook up to this one was able to output the video signal via the HDMI out on this USB hub in the same configuration. If Tab Ultra is supposed to be a tablet PC, then this functionality would be a must, especially because screen sharing via Miracast is so hit and miss that, yeah, it, 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 it would be nice to actually have an option for a reliable 
wired connection for video out. The Ultra comes with a redesigned UI specifically for it. So now you have the ability to add and arrange app widgets, as you can see here. So you can have different widgets and you can rescale them, you can move them around and you can have different home screens as well, more in line with what you are used to from an Android 11 home screen environment. The overall responsiveness of the system is extremely fast, which makes it quite enjoyable to use. However, not everything is that great. We have the usual issue of a steep learning curve, especially for the beginners. And books could actually learn a thing or two from Remarkable and Supernote on how to design and implement good enrollment tooltip helpers. Card system does finally have tooltips that, and some of them are useful, but they are not nearly as clear or as useful as the ones found on Remarkable and Supernote. So that's definitely an area that can be improved further. There is a standard system-wide split screen uh, functionality which works as expected. It's important to keep in mind that only supported apps will be able to work in the split screen mode and that it's not possible to have two separate notebooks opened at the same time. Only a document and a notebook or a notebook and an app or a document and an app. It's also worth mentioning that for a while now we've had the option of choosing the horizontal or vertical split screen mode. Android 11 has a built-in screen cap which is basically a mirror cast a screen sharing capability and if by some miracle you're able to establish a secure connection then it works well but this will come down to the limitations of the mirror cast technology and it's really sensitive to a variety of different things and it will not work perfectly in all setups so it will be quite a bit of a hit and miss and will depend on a large number of factors, your Wi-Fi router, your Wi-Fi connection, your firewall, your antivirus, overall device compatibility, versions, etc. blah, blah, blah. So that actually works so bad that in this case, I didn't find a single device in my house that was able to actually receive the Miracast connection and, and maintain it. And that's not only this device, I, I constantly have issues with the Miracast from any Android device and some are able to establish a connection, but none of them actually work re reliably and I think that's down to the Miracast itself. What is great is that because it's Android 11, you're able to basically go to Google Play and install any other third party screen sharing app of your choice. And in case that Miracast doesn't work for your setup, like it doesn't work for me, and then you can actually screen share more reliably that way. Tab Ultra can be used as a monitor. Um, and while it doesn't have a direct video in, I was able to effortlessly use the Tab Ultra as an external screen using the third party apps, such as Space Desk, or my preferred one is the Super Monitor. It was really easy to set it all up and the established connection was stable, worked during a standard session, sleep, uh, device going to sleep, waking up, anything, never a hitch and it just works as it's supposed to work. As for the point of how it is to use a 10.3 inch monochromatic ink screen as an external monitor, well, that will depend entirely on your use case scenario and needs. In general, for browsing, reading, text editing, some light spreadsheet work and limited coding, it was fine. The refresh rates are very good and it is overall a much more usable version of the external monitor than the tablets before it. The ghosting improvement, clarity and contrast and everything means that actually when you plug in a mouse, you can see the mouse cursor and the ghosting is not a complete nightmare, which results in you actually being able to use a mouse on this screen. And this is a first for me because every time before this device, the ghosting was a complete mess. Keyboard typing is excellent and it feels like there is very, very little lag regardless of which keyboard I was using. Unfortunately, this is not something that I can use in my line of work regularly, but for those who don't mind the small size of the screen and if you're primarily reading or writing, then the Tab Ultra can definitely be used as an external screen in a limited capacity. However, if you do choose to use it as an external screen, you need to be aware of the following. First of all, never use it as an external screen while the device is still plugged into the power at the same time. 
That is an absolute sure way to overstress the battery and put it into simultaneous state of rapid discharge and charge, which means rapid overheating and eventual failure. You can expect that the battery consumption to be higher than normal when using the tablet as an external screen, and touch uh, input from the tablet will not necessarily translate to the device you are sending the signal from. This functionality will depend on the app and protocols that you are uh, using and the OS platform that you are sending the video signal from. For me, for example, the, I know that the super monitor works perfectly and the touch signals are sent wirelessly to the Windows 10 and it works perfectly fine. But I know that other apps have some of those issues and especially with the uh, OS X uh, operating system. On top of all of this, you have the pre-enabled Google Play Store, which gives you the ability to install and use virtually any Android app that you want. Uh, there are some limitations. The main one is that you shouldn't expect the same type of writing performance on non-native apps. The reason for this is that the non-native apps are not optimized for e-ink devices. And as such, they will in most cases be unusably slow or unsuitable to work in. The exception to this rule are apps that have been optimized for e-ink devices. OneNote and Evernote fall into that category. And if you are on an Android 11 system, then it will work uh, pretty, pretty well. On an Android 10 system, there's a cheat system and where you're actually right on top of the screen. It's not adjustable. It's a thin line. It just is like kind of baked onto the document after you're done writing. And that only works on OneNote. The Evernote is a complete mess on Android 10. So this kind of compatibility thing that it works, it's only valid as far as I know for the Android 11. Uh, and, and there it actually works pretty much fine. You can install both Kindle and Kobo apps or comics as well and Audible and use them as you normally would. So some people keep asking like, is it possible to write in Kobo and uh, um, Kindle apps? And the answer is no, simply because those apps don't have that functionality on any platform. Now, when Amazon Scribe comes out, maybe uh, Amazon will update the Kindle app for Android. And when that happens, then yes, there will be the support for that, but we'll have to see what the speed functionality will be. But as far as the normal Kindle operation goes, oh, this is not downloaded, there we go. It just works properly as you would expect it to. And yes, you do have a dark mode, if we go, I guess it was in themes or layout, layout is there. So you can switch it to a dark mode, etc., etc. And while the, uh, the difference is always going to be there between the native Kindle app and how it works on an Android and also the native Kobo app on Android and how it works on a dedicated Kobo reader. Um, the thing is that you do have the flexibility and the functionality of actually combining and using all of those libraries on a single device, which is actually pretty cool. One of the big additions to the Tab Ultra is the 16 megapixel rear camera. And I understand why it is useful, and it most certainly is, as you can simply take a photograph of a document, do a direct OCR conversion of the page, and then further use the uh, converted content in the Android environment definitely useful and definitely cool. And uh, that's an excellent bit of functionality to uh, have in a professional environment. I just wish that the camera was not protruding from the back those two and a half millimeters as it is now, because it simply is them kind of making this thing and forces you to use the um, um, the, the magnetic cover, uh, which fixes that issue. But it's an unnecessary issue as far as I'm concerned. It could have been inside and level with the body. And adding that keyboard to the mix just makes the Tab Ultra even more powerful um, as it actually transforms very effortlessly into an actual tablet 
PC. As such, I can definitely see certain work situations where this device can actually replace a simple low performance laptop or an existing tablet. The situations in which that will be true are limited, yes, but they are definitely there. It's an exciting thing to actually see an e-ink device step into such a category. So the Tab Ultra is a very capable e-ink device overall. When coupled with a new keyboard cover and the updated UI, it really is transformed into a sort of tablet, PC, reader, note taker hybrid. And while it is by no means perfect, it definitely has its fair share of limitations and quirks and some irritations as well. Overall, it is a platform and a device that is incredibly versatile, powerful and capable and basically one of the most important e-ink devices to come out uh, into the market in a very, very long time. So the Books Tab Ultra costs 599 US dollars base unit alone. And if you go for the uh, bundle packages, then you can go upwards of a little bit above 700 US dollars for the most expensive package. And then depending on where you're buying it from, you might also have to account for the import taxes and maybe shipping. That might not be case for every purchase, but it really depends your location and where it's being delivered. So all of these things have to be taken into account. This is a very high sum for a 10.3 inch 227 ppi device, especially if you take into consideration that around February, Big Me is supposed to be launching their Gallery 3 powered uh, e-ink device named Galley. And that one is supposed to cost around $700, I believe. And uh, we have Amazon on Scribe, which is shipping imminently, like in about a week or so, it's going to start shipping. And that one is at $339, yet that's a 10.2 inch uh, device with a 300 ppi screen. So the main question then is, is the Tab Ultra worth it? And the answer is actually very simple. If what you're looking for is an e-ink powered tablet that is able to actually replace some of your laptop functionalities, or you are interested in experiencing and using the very best that e-ink technology was ever able to actually deliver, then the answer is a resounding yes. If, however, what you're looking for and what you're interested in is a traditional e-reader or a simple e-note taking device, something that's portable, something that's simple, something that's easy to actually use, then no, it is not going to be worth it because it's far too bulky, it's far too complicated, and it's a little bit too heavy for these things. And it's, quite frankly, that's not what it's supposed to be. Because remember, Tab Ultra is supposed to be a tablet PC e-ink device. All right, so now we are at conclusion time for the Tab Ultra. And as usual, let's start with the cons. First of all, it's somewhat of a bulky device. Misrepresented weight of the device as it weighs approximately 22 to 24 grams more than what is being advertised by books, because it actually weighs 502 or 504 grams instead of 480 that the books claims. It is not the most ergonomically device to use as a reader. As a writing device, it's surprisingly comfortable, but as a reader, it's not really the most comfortable device to hold in a hand and just kind of go around the business of e-reading. The camera housing that protrudes and is a little bit misaligned, definitely a con. Screen reflectivity, absolutely a con. Battery life while reading, uh, not as good as expected. It has a fairly steep learning curve because yes, it is a fairly powerful system, but there are better ways of actually doing these things and simplifying uh, this system so that newcomers and even experienced users, it doesn't have to be that much of a head scratcher to learn how to use and enjoy a device like this. The magnetic cover is limited and only landscape options and even those uh, um, stand options are not that good as some of them slip and fall. So definitely too limited for the price point. And overall, it is a very expensive device. Now on to the pros of the Tab Ultra. The fastest writing latency of any e-ink device and maybe 
be any device. I have to measure out the Apple, but let's just stick to e-ink. The fastest writing latency on any e-ink device currently on the market on the planet. The fastest and cleanest image quality of any e-ink tablet device currently on the market. Pen 2 Pro comes as a standard, excellent value. Expandable storage via the micro SD up to two terabytes. Pretty freaking cool. Excellent specifications and overall performance. Yes, it could do with six gigabytes of RAM, but four gigabytes is actually quite plenty for all the tasks that you might need it to do. Excellent integration of the camera as a scanner into the overall system. One of the best and most powerful reader apps on the market, the Neo Reader. Very comprehensive and very powerful notebook system. It actually offers a fantastic writing experience and comfort levels. Searchable handwritten notes and the AI recognition of handwritten notes has been improved with the update 3.3.1. Full experience of Android 11 with pre-enabled Google Play. No mumbo jumbo, you're just fired up and Google Play is right there. Very easy integration into any kind of ecosystem or a workflow that you already might have. And the addition of the keyboard cover actually transforms the Tab Ultra into a true tablet PC device. Well, not perfect by any means. Ergonomics, battery life, steep learning curve, screen reflectivity, weight. Tab Ultra breaks many of the barriers previously perceived that an e-ink device absolutely must have. It is a device that represents a generational shift and it's the first one of its kind. It sets several new standards on the e-ink device market that other manufacturers and devices will have to try to follow and match and are gonna have a very hard time actually beating probably in years to come. So the conclusion is actually very simple. If what you're looking for is a simple e-reader, e-note-taking device, the Tab Ultra is not it and you need to look somewhere else. If what you're looking for is a e-ink powered tablet PC or, as I said, you want to experience the very best that the e-ink technology and the e-ink world can actually offer you today, and you are ready to accept a couple of compromises that come with all of that, being the first of its kind and all of that kind of stuff, then there's absolutely nothing out there on the e-ink market that can come even close to the Tab Ultra.